Okay. Well, Dr. Penny, floor is yours. Go ahead, sir. Perfect. So let me apologize in advance. Um, my laptop uh, loves to do its own thing. And so what may end up happening uh, is that we may have some like glitches and stuff like that. So if there's something that I missed or that you can't hear, please uh, know that it's not on purpose um, and that it's not you, it may be me. <clears throat> now, with that in mind, I do kind of want to start with the framework of, 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 uh, of why we're here. Uh, I was reached out, you know, y'all's professor, Dr. Dixon reached out to me to kind of talk a little bit more about intersectionality and so as I sat with it and, and thought more about what does that mean, I decided to take a different, I won't even call it really a different approach, but a, a much more a micro approach about intersectionality in the therapist, in the therapist client relationship. And I think that becomes vitally important because I think we as clinicians and you all as student clinicians and, and the like, um, sometimes we struggle with the idea and the, the subject matter of neutrality. So we're supposed to be neutral members and neutral service providers for other people. And as we know, we as individuals have our own life circumstances that come with us, right? Um, and so I wanted to take a moment to kind of give you a little disclaimer about what it was. Um, Yes, Joey, I'm, you beat me to it. I was want to give you a disclaimer about my approach and then kind of do the thing with the presentation. So intersectionality uh, is a really, uh, oh no, Joey, Joey, you're fine. So I can see y'all's chat stuff. So if I, if I say your name, if I respond to you directly, uh, that's why. So if, if, if you're wondering why Joey's getting the thing, it's because your chats, I can see them while I'm talking. Um, but intersectionality um, is a word that is popular now and new now, but the idea of intersections in who we are as people is not a new thing. So intersectionality is the understanding of the different ideas of our identity, right? So each one of us has multiple roles that we play and each role has its own rules that we must play by, right? And the idea that these all these roles come together, they come together like a four-way stop sign. And in the middle of that stop sign is you as a person. And each role has its own road that we go down. That's a really simple and easy way to kind of understand intersectionality, right? So in that same capacity, I'm gonna take you guys on like a on what I what I think is a really good and profound journey with me on how we understand intersectionality from a cultural perspective, right? So <clears throat> it's, uh, let's, 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 let's do this. So uh, Dr. Uh, Pamela Hayes has a wonderful book talking about addressing the multicultural differences that we have in cultural competency. And a part of that is that she lays out nine really interesting dimensions of culture as we understand them, right? So I'm gonna go through as many of them as possible. Um, Hopefully I don't crap out and forget any. And if I do, I'll do my best to give, give it Dr. Dixon and everyone else here and give you uh, the information. So I wanna start first um, by defining her model. So her model is the addressing model of culture. So it within it is nine very specific things that we go down. And I'm gonna use myself as an example and tell you what she means. And then after I'm done doing that, I'll tell you what that confluence is like in the actual clinical environment with a client. Okay, we'll see if we can make it through it. If I get sidetracked, please be nice to me, right? I do this for a living, which means I like to talk a lot and hear myself talk. All right, so let's start with the first one. So in the, the, the addressing model, the first thing there is the A, and the A stands for age and cohort effects, right? I'm gonna give you, so I am a 34 year old human, right? That's what I am, my whole 34 year old, which also means that I would be considered a millennial. Right. And I want to I want to be very, very clear. All of us millennials are between the ages of like 42 and about 28. There's a, so anybody that's a little bit like if you like 24, 22, you're more Gen Z than you are millennial. But what we know to be true is everybody blames millennials for everything. Right. We're responsible for the damages to Zales. We're responsible for the decline in housing sales. We're responsible for this 
And we're responsible for that. When in reality, it's just young people being young people, right? So a part of the cohort effect when dealing with millennials is understanding experiences that we've had to this point. Every millennial to this point has was alive for things such as September the 11th, 2001. You may not remember where you were, you may not remember what you were doing, but we were around for it, right? We also have been around for things such as uh, the birth of the internet and not the birth of the internet in terms of, you know, it, we, we were here when it was first born because that was done long before we were alive, but we were here for the widespread access of the internet. I remember my first AOL screen name, my AIM screen name. I had one, I did. And most of us did because most of us are 80s babies and 90s kids. What that looks like is we were on there. My, my screen name was Baby Mickey 2025. Do not ask me why I had that name, but it was a name that I had, right? And so as a millennial, I remember very much the first episode of the Rugrats, right? I remember Hey Arnold, and I remember Nickelodeon as its beginning stages rap, right? Are You Afraid of the Dark, the Kenan and Kel show, all that, the original all that, not the remake that they did a few years ago, but the original one, right? I remember the things such as the birth and the death of, of grunge music, right? And it didn't really die, but it was around, right? When we lost Kurt Cobain to an overdose, that was a thing, right? That was a big thing. I was, I was alive and well and kicking when Michael Jordan won all six of his championships. I also was alive and well and kicking when the Houston Rockets got their two championships in between. I got to see uh, the Houston Oilers. I know many of you may not know who they are anymore because of the Houston Texans, but I remember Houston's original football team, the Houston Oilers. I remember them because Warren Moon was a player. If you don't know, I didn't do the introduction. So I'm from the greatest place on earth, Houston, Texas. So I will, I will always bring in something to do with Houston. So being 34, soon to be 35, means that my life, uh, my life experiences are different, right? So I got to know technology, but if you ask me a little bit about Tiki Talk, I don't know nothing about it. I don't know what a Tiki Talk is. I barely have a Facebook. I do not know how to make a reel on Instagram, right? But if we're being honest, the millennials were the one that opens the door for the influencers. Because think about the social media influencers and their ages and like the ones who have the most money. Most of them are between the ages of 26 and 42. Your Kim Kardashians of the world, like your, your, your car, any of that, like that's a whole thing. So that's the age part. The, the second part of it is disability. So either disability by birth or disability that you've acquired, right? So as an able-bodied man, right, an able-bodied 34-year-old, my disability presents very differently, right? Because on the surface, I don't have an ailment to my physical person. I don't walk with a limp. I don't do anything. But are you ready for my disability? Here it is. I have allergies. And you may say, well, allergies isn't really a disability. Well, it would depend on the severity of said allergy, right? and the access to it. I'll give you an example. So at my current place of employment, we had an assistant director um, to our training clinic who could not deal with fragrances. So if she smelled a fragrance, she could easily go into anaphylactic shock. Peanut allergy, food allergy, yes, Jordan, those are all things that come into play. Remember, I'm on vacation with my family. One of my family members has very specific eating and food related allergies. MSG, she cannot have, which means she has to ask very specific questions about what's there to be eaten. Yeast extract, she cannot have. I have a friend who cannot do um, uh, color dye because it makes her flare up. I had another friend, we were at breakfast one time, enjoying ourselves. He told them, hey, I can't have granola. And they put granola on it and took it off of his yogurt, but it was still enough dust in it to make his... his um, his windpipe start to close. So we had had Benadryl and if things were to go crazy, we were definitely able to make stuff happen. But disabilities are a part of it. And disability is not just the things that we can see. 
uh, a part of my work um, before I became a professor was working with people who had learning disabilities and differences, right? And those of us in this profession, we know that many people come to life, they come to the world with, with, it, with issues that are invisible, right? And those are sometimes the hardest ones, the hardest people to support are people who have invisible disabilities. And that's a part of it. So people who have ADHD, people who are on the spectrum for autism, people who may have uh, specific learning disabilities where they can't do well with math, people who have issues writing on the on paper. And so because I work with teenagers and I work with kids and that was a part of that in my life, um, we have a lot of people who have served those children, who have a very uh, thwarted view of them because well, how can you be disabled? Why do you need these? Why do you need this attention? Why do you need these interventions? You're just like everybody else. When in reality, just because we present the same doesn't mean that we are the same. Okay. So we've done the two D. So we did, uh, <clears throat> we did the age. We did disability and then developmental disability. Then there is an ADD R. Yeah, R. <laughs> I had to think about it um, because I'm not. Yeah, ADDR. So R is for race and ethnic presentation, right? The two are very, very different. They're not the same, but they are often lumped the same. Racial identification and ethnic presentation are very, very different. I'm gonna give you an example. So in America on the census, we are asked, what is your ethnicity? Are you a Spanish speaking white person or a non-Spanish speaking white person? Those kinds of things. And the reason that exists is because ethnicity is more than just what color your skin is, right? It's more than just how you identify as your race. And so ethnicity ties back to a whole bunch of other political things. And we'll get into that a little bit later but there is something to be said there. So I am a 34 year old man who's got allergies really bad. Like I had breakfast and my ears start itching and my throat start closing. So I had to run back to the room. It was fun. Um, who is a black man. And my black skin creates for me a, 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 a burden, but not the burden for me to carry. The burden is for other people to carry. I'm gonna say that again, as a black man, I have a burden by being a black man, but the burden isn't on me. The burden is on other people. Um, being from the great state of Texas, uh, we have a lot of interesting uh, interactions about the, uh, the interface and the, the um, intersection, I'll say, of race and culture and education. So a few years ago, there was a young man who was valedictorian of his high school, I believe, but he had locks. Right, and what people would not commonly call dreadlocks, but we don't, I don't use that word, and there's a whole reason for that. Um, but he had locks, and he was the valedictorian. And they told him, unless he cut his hair, they would not let him walk. Excuse me, what? I'm sorry, huh? You, you're telling me the thing that naturally grows out of my hair, right? My scalp. So, this right here, this is not a product, this is my hair, right? I am now in trouble because my hair grows differently than yours. How is that fair? I worked really hard as, the, as, the, as this child. I'm doing all these things. And because my hair is different, I, huh? I have, um, my partner has kids, which means I have children. I have three boys, three sons, and they're all black boys, which means that they've gone from being cute kids at four to by the time they're five, they're considered to be dangerous. If we look at the statistics of when children, black children become, uh, when, when the things that we do no longer become childlike and they become things that are th thought of as malicious and intentional, it happens right around the age of first grade. I wrote an article uh, with a few people that I know and love and, and we talked about um, from diapers to degrees and diplomas. And a big part of that was looking at the study that was done about uh, school rules in the state of Texas. In the state of Texas, the things that get kids the most in trouble that are black and brown kids are things such as disrespect to teacher. What does that mean? How does that make sense? And so if we're gonna consider the people that we serve at the intersections um, in, our, in our clinical practice, we gotta kinda reconcile what that looks like. All right, so we talked a little bit about race 
and ethnicity. Let's talk about the E. The E in it stands for education, right? Education. So I am, in order for me to be Dr. Penny, I gotta have at least one degree and I got three of them. Way too many of them. I pay way too much money for them. So my soul, my two left kidneys and six toes. It was a lot to get it, but I got it, right? But that idea of being an educated person gives me an access and privilege that other people won't have, right? Because most things, most tests, most stuff that's written is normed on seventh grade reading level. Because the average American person, right, has about a seventh grade reading level for a variety of reasons. Um, but one of those things that we do know is that schools teach differently based on a few things, right? So we're gonna go, so I'm gonna tie in this first S. And the first S is socioeconomic status. So I'm gonna say it again. Your education level can be directly impacted by the amount of money that the people you love and live with have. So think about it like this. I grew up, I am from Third War, Houston, Texas. I love being where, from where I'm from. It's a wonderful place to be from, but it's not a place I wanna live in. So I'm gonna say that again. It's a great place to be from, but it's not a place I wanna live. And anybody who's ever lived in or come from a limited resource environment will tell you the desire to go home again is always there. The reality of going home again is often not the same. There have been a, a lot of people, a lot of really influential uh, artists and uh, uh, MCs who have tried to go home again, even if it was just to visit, if it was just to do certain things, and what they found out repeatedly is you can't go home again. So most recently, uh, the rapper Young Dolph was in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee, just going and do so. He went to get cookies and lost his life because he tried to go home again. And not that Memphis is the, is the portion that makes it bad. It's the fact that he tried to just go and be with the people that he loved for a little bit to buy some cookies. So imagine being a kid, right? And you are living your life. You're just going to school, trying to do uh, the best you can and do the stuff that you, you, know, you wanna do, you wanna dream, you wanna have access to things, but you don't know what you don't know. I was fortunate. I had a mom and a dad who were on me. They were on me. Like my mama, there was nothing that, it was in the city of Houston that we could get to that she wouldn't let me get to. This includes museums and the zoo. Even if that meant we had to get on the bus to get there, we got there. Like I knew the zoo well. I had been to the Museum of Natural Science more times than I get a count. My first IMAX movie was in the Museum of Natural Science watching the, uh, watching the dinosaurs documentary. That was how I learned about IMAX. Put on the glasses, scared, scared me half to death. I'm, I'm a, I, I curse a lot. I won't curse now because it's being recorded and I know I'm already on vacation. So I'm trying to be a good person, right? But the IMAX movie thing. So let's, let's consider now if my mom and dad didn't know. I wouldn't know, right? I grew up uh, in a place where there were... Um, places where drugs were being sold regularly in vicinity to where I laid my head at night. When I was a child, um, we lived in a duplex and one night there was a, a ruckus outside. And what we found out was our, our, our neighbor behind us had stabbed and killed his wife. We talk a lot about uh, the idea of socioeconomic status, but I don't think we really talk about the reality of the limitations that come when you don't have, right? Again, I'm a fortunate, I am a fortunate bird because I'm not the smartest member of the crew that I hung with. I'm just the most fortunate member of the crew that I hung with. So right now we've done age, we've done disability, we've done developmental disability, we've talked about race and ethnicity, we've talked about education, we've talked about socioeconomic status, but then here's the one that we really don't touch a lot in our training with people, and it's religion and spiritual orientation. 
And the reason why I think our profession does a disservice to so many of you entry-level clinicians is because we don't teach you how to leverage that part of a person's identity. Because there, um, there, there is something about the wellness that we can bring to the conversation when we talk about how we make sense of things beyond our control. Because religion and spirituality is just that. How do I make sense of when life is unfair? Why is it that good things happen to bad people, right? And I mean that there are bad people who get good things because we often talk about bad things happening to good people, but we rarely conceptualize how people like our former chief administrative officer of the United States of America, and I said it on purpose, uh, Donald Trump was elected as president. Because let's consider for a minute what his resume is and what the resume of the pre president who was selected right before him was, right? Donald Trump is a failed businessman who had a really big voice and had a lot of support pushing him. Barack Obama was a, a Harvard educated lawyer who was a Senator. And before that he worked with the nonprofit sector in Chicago. And he got elected president, and he had to go through hell and high water to be elected president the first time. And then again, the second time. So compare and contrast those two realities, right? When we consider the idea that sometimes the things that we care about, we cannot always have access to, it makes it tough. And so as people who, who are serving um, others, who have an, or an, orientate, an orientation, even if it's atheist and I don't believe that it's still an orientation, we, it is always better to struggle and make sense with that. So let me give you my identity. I grew up in a black Baptist church. My God, we'd go in at eight and we get out about 12. And so I know y'all have heard the stories before. It's a wonderful identity. It's a part of who I am. And when I am the most stressed, you can hear me singing the hymns that I grew up hearing. But if you ask me if I'm in church now, I'll gl gladly tell you with a smile on my face, no ma'am, no sir. I like to call myself, I'm a self-proclaimed heathen, not because I do heathenistic type things, but because I grew up where if you were not in church, you had turned from the Lord's blessing. It doesn't make it true, but it does make it a reality. And if we're talking about, if we're talking about the intersections of a yes, Joey backslider. <laughs> if we're talking about the intersections of uh, what it means to have a spiritual orientation, we have to also consider the condemnation and guilt and shame that can come with what someone's identity is there. I'm listening to a book by uh, Candace Benbo, and she is a, in my mind, one of a very prolific womanist theologian. It's called Red Lip Theology. She talks about her journey um, through life and through spirituality by talking about how you apply makeup. So each chapter is also tied well to a makeup approach. So cleaning your face or applying blush or applying foundation, wearing your eyeliner. And she tells very distinct storylines from her experiences. And the one I finished yesterday while on the plane trying to get here was talking about her relationship with God as it relates to sex and sexual orientation. Think about this for, an, for a minute, right? You have a person who is in your clinical environment. They're there under your care. They wanna know more about things. They're trying to work through their life plans and problems. And they come to you and they're saying that they are experiencing the condemnation for having premarital sex. How do you deal with it? How do you leverage the spirituality by which they know and love to help them deal with and cope with that very heavy feeling of humiliation and shame, the guilt of it all, right? So that's something to consider. That's the, that's the spiritual orientation in that thing. Yeah, okay. The, the I is for indigenous status. We don't often think about how the uh, how we manage and deal with the idea of being indigenous. What is it? That? that means that you are native to the land in which you're living on, but someone else has come over and taken over that which you were once native to, 
right? So think about it like this. Um, this is a very, uh, this is a very, uh, very, very reduced version of it. But remember, I'm from Third Ward, Houston, Texas. Love being where I'm from. I'm indigenous to that space, but when I go back home, it looks nothing like the home that I used to. Gentrification is a very, <laughs> it's a very interesting way to displace a people group. Um, in, in the form of what is once indigenous. And I'm not saying that people of, of color or people who lived in limited resource environments are indigenous there, meaning that they made their bed there. I am saying though, indigenous status has a very similar relationship with colonization that people who are residents of certain environments has with gentrification. Because it's not often, it's not all the time that colonization and gentrification have to be physically violent. Oftentimes, if I cut off your resources, then I have, you don't have to do nothing. So let's think about it. So I am, a, I am a person who loves history. I don't like necessarily reading the books. I'll listen to them, right? But one of my favorite books that I've just finished, maybe last year, was an Indigenous People's History of the Americas. It's a really, really good book. And it talks about how there were people who were living on in the Americas, minding their own business, and individuals from other countries and other sides of the world came and they took what was theirs. And they didn't always have to kill the person to kill the people. They would do things like torch their land. They would kill off their grazing, like they'd kill off their, their main food source of the buffalo. They would blockade things. So a lot of the warfare that people have that are in and in, in and from indigenous nations actually occurs because, or actually occur without much bloodshed on one end, right? Like I don't have to necessarily kill you to kill you. When we think about gentrification in areas around, I have a book called The Color of Law and then I have another book called, uh, I think it's like area codes or zip codes. It's called zip codes and it's about like, where you live and how where you live uh, and the accesses that you have are determined by your zip code, right? So the access that the, the, the access to resources that exist is not often it's not the same. It's not the same. We, we live in a place that preaches equality, but we often don't see the behaviors given that way. So indigenous status. The next one is nationality. So place of origin. Where do you come from, right? What is your originating place? I'm a member of the United States of America. I originated here. My mama originated here. My daddy, my grandparents, they originated here. It does not mean that there is not a place outside of the United States of America where I can trace back lineage, but it does mean my nation of origin is the United States of America, which means I also carry with me the privilege of knowing American culture. There is a reality that happens here when we consider that if you are new to American culture, it will be a cultural shock. I love the show. Listen, I am a fan because my partner likes, um, she likes uh, 90 Day Fiance. So we watch 90 Day Fiance and watching people try to adjust in 90 days to an entirely different world it's chaos because think about it, Jordan, you, I mean, you at the house right now, you're enjoying your life. What would you do if tomorrow you had to leave everything you have ever known and go, go to a whole new place with whole new customs? Joey, how would you make sense of the fact that the food that you've come to love and enjoy may not be where you are? Teresa, how do you, how do you sit with the reality that the language that you know so intimately, right? You may not be able to speak it well. And then flip it. So, so I want us to flip that now. So we've been here this whole time and then people come and they begin to use English, but they're using it in a way that doesn't make sense, right? They're saying words and they're doing the best they can to articulate their points. But what do you do when you're saying things? I mean, you're really trying to communicate, but what you're saying doesn't make sense. I live here. God, I live here. I've been here my whole life. I've lived in the state of Texas my whole life, different parts, but the whole state, same state. But what I've come to realize is even living in Texas, even living with the idea that there are 
people who are from Texas, there are different idioms that make sense in different parts of Texas. So I may be a na I am a national. I am a, I am a I am a heritage Texan, baby. All up and through my blood is Texas. I don't want to live nowhere else but Texas. But if you ask me, how do I talk to people in in Houston versus how do I talk to people in Lubbock? They're very different. The conversations that we have are very, very different. In Houston, I can say certain things and use certain lingos, right? Whole thing makes sense. If I use that in, in Lubbock, it may not make the same sense. Now, there are some things that unify us, but it's a little bit different, right? So we talked about national origin. Now let's get to the G. The G is for gender and sexual orientation because they're not the same. They're very, very different. And we have to talk about that in, in the ways that it makes sense. My, I have, I have people in my life who I love very, very dearly who are transgender. And if you did not know, you would not. Know. I've done the work with students who are transgender. And if you did not know, you would not know. So what that means then is that as we relate to the idea of being cis versus trans, as we consider the idea of being man, woman, boy, girl versus being gender non-conforming or gender non-binary, we got to talk about how there is something to be uh, said about the privilege that comes with being cisgender. I don't have to consider what my pronouns will be. I don't have to consider if I feel the most at home in my skin or in my clothes. Right, um, having loving women and, and being a part of that uh, that kind of heterosexual uh, and heteronormative lifestyle means that there's an advantage to being a man. I have a unique power advantage of being a man and identifying as such. I can get away with a whole bunch of stuff because I'm a man. And what do we know? Men, the bar for men for fatherhood, the bar, the bar for being a good partner as a man, the bar for how you express your emotions is very, very low. But there's also an inherent barrier in being a man. And one of those barriers is how we are socialized to express our anger, our, our pain, our disappointment. I, um, I'm fortunate I have a lot of women in my life who love me who teach me, who train me to be better versions of myself. Um, and one of the things we talk about is how men are socialized to only experience two emotions, anger and happy. Not even joy, anger and happy. Not happiness, but anger and happy. And that's on purpose. Because if you think about it, think about when, uh, if you watch sports, if you watch men celebrate, it's a very aggressive form of celebration. There's a lot of screaming, there's a, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of, a lot of aggressive high fives, a lot of chest bumps. That's really aggressive, that can hurt, right? And if you're not accustomed to the culture of men's celebration, it looks weird, right? And men only can, here recently, are only coming into the place where we can say the things that mean something to us. And yet and still, as men, we struggle with saying the words, right? I'm a big I love you person. I love telling the people I love that I love you. And you should see the men that I love the first time they hear me say it to them and they've never heard it before. They go, Whoa. Because the, the, the assumption is that men's love is understood but may not be spoken. I am also a cisgender heterosexual man, which means that the world is my oyster. Every show, it's got me in it. All the movies have me in it. The people who are my elected officials look like me and have me in it for the most part in terms of my gender and, and my gender identification and sexual orientation. Cool, right? The, the, the things that I want to wear are perfect for me, right? Easy. But imagine being a person who is trans but is also heterosexual. Because the identification of your gender doesn't necessarily impact who you will like. And that's complicated. And it, it presents to them, to the people who are experiencing these things, complications. So how much more does it present to us who are serving them the same complications? 
So let's think about this. So we are all clinicians, clinicians in training. We own it. This is the job that we chose. This is the business that we've chosen. If you're a Godfather fan, you know they're lying, right? This is the business that we've chosen. We've chosen to do this. So how then does it show up in the room? I'll tell you how. At least I'll tell you how from my perspective. So as a clinician, I love my job. 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 I love what I do. I love being a counselor educator. But the thing I love most is I love being a clinical supervisor. And I will tell you why. Because the hardest part of the work is not in session. The hardest part of the work is how you see the client before you ever meet them. How you conceptualize a client's issues, a client's struggles, a client's limitations become vastly important because it will impact how you handle them and their sufferings. What we know is that the medical environment, medical and healthcare related things for people of color is not always the best place for us to be. The idea that black people specifically have tougher skin and have a higher pain tolerance because it's written in the book creates, uh, right? Creates a lot because I don't know about y'all. I don't like pain. I don't, I don't do pain. It hurt. It hurt. If you hit me, it's going to hurt me. And if I hit you back and we go get to tussling, that's a different story. Um, but it hurts, right? And, and the idea from a mental health standpoint that children and black people and, and, and black men and women and black gender non-conforming individuals struggle just like everyone else with their mental health and mental wellness, but aren't given the same leeway by which to express it in our profession does create complications. Because what we know is there used to be a diagnosis for people who were enslaved that wanted freedom. It was considered to be abnormal for a person enslaved to not want to be enslaved anymore. It was considered a mental health issue. That was a problem. The idea that Black children, right, um, would struggle with attention, <clears throat> it, it could have struggled with attention in the classroom, but are considered bad children, creates another complication. Right? Or the, the reality that depression for Black people, and I'm saying this on purpose, that depression for Black people does create complications because where do I go to get sad? Where do I go to be sad? I, I'm not a social media person for real, but I like to go on every now and then. And last Sunday, over the weekend, last weekend, in Buffalo, New York, at a grocery store, much like the grocery stores that I grew up going to, and that my mom goes to, and that my grandmother goes to, and my cousins and my aunts. Someone decided to drive for hours simply because Black people were in the grocery store and decided that it was their duty to eradicate, to murder Black people in the grocery store. Where do I go to put that down? Where can I go to sit that down? Where can I, as a Black person, go and show up and, and be given the space and the liberty to just be human? In the summer of 2020, so right around the time of the COVID happening, there was a, a racial uprising allegedly in America, right? Due to the death of George Floyd. The irony is George Floyd actually was a friend of my family. My cousins went to school with Floyd. In fact, George Floyd was a truck driver and he inspired my older cousin to drive trucks. How do I make sense of that? Because when it happened, I was teaching. I was full on teaching for the summertime? Or how do I make sense of the fact that 
Kyle Rittenhouse can go and drive and murder and let be let off by the justice system. But a baby like Tamir, Tamir Rice or someone like Sandra Bland will lose their life because a police officer fell to it. And those people never see trial. And if they see trial, they get off. How do I make sense of the fact that I'm asleep in my house and just because someone has the wrong address can come into my house and murder me like they did Breonna Taylor and can get off and the only charge that comes is they shot into another person's house. We're clinicians. If you see black people, how do you make sense of that? I'm a clinician. And when I see white people, I gotta tell you, it's really hard not to be the clinician. It's not hard to do that. It's not hard to show up for them, but it is hard every day in my everyday life to see, to, to, to take my experiences that exist outside of the therapy room and hold them within myself and show up for my clients, my clients that are white. Luckily for me, I don't have that many um, in that capacity, so my service is different there. But in my educational capacity, I have a lot of students that are white. And a lot of them are white women. And what I know as a black man is that the worst thing for me is the tears of a white woman. Because when a white woman cries, the entire world stops, even if nothing happened. There was a baby who went down south for the summertime was minding his business and did what kids do. Said something slick to a woman. He was trying to be fly and impress his friends and he never made it home again. And that not, not only did he not make it home again, they maimed him, they lynched him and they tied bar barbed wire around his throat. Their baby's name is Emmett Till. Imagine it, Joey, you, you just, you're outside and you're being a kid, you're 15, you're being a kid. You may have played the game, step on a crack, break your mama's back and you step on a crack and your mama back there, but someone punches you in the face and they repeatedly punch you in the face because they felt like how you stepped on a crack was, was insufficient. What do you do with that? And there's nothing you can do because you will die if you do or you will die if you don't. So what do you do with that? And these are things that are historical in nature. Our profession will recognize that depression can be passed down to through generations for members of family members. So for, for family members of people who survived the Holocaust through the idea of epigenetics. But we do not discuss in our profession the reality that stress is also passed down and creates genetic mutation from things like the enslavement period of the United States of America from things like the Jim Crow era of the United States of America, the lynching era of the United, the war on drugs, the war on poverty. These are all things, right, that continue to hit us. And Teresa, you say generational curses. I'm gonna take it into a different direction because curses implies that it is beyond our control, that it's something spiritual and supernatural. When in reality, the things that are passed to us are, not, are neither spiritual or religious, they are pure evil and not evil from things that are beyond us, but the evil from things that are within us, right? Each of us has, a, has the choice between dominance and equity, right? Um, and what that looks like is when you could choose to share power with somebody, do you use your power and lord over them to make them do what you want them? And the wonderful place that we live, the United States of America, is one that preaches love as dominance. I love you, therefore I rule over you. Um, our expertise as dominance. I know more, therefore I should be in charge. 
And when we consider the work that we do, right? If you are a person who is of the psychoanalytic school or the cognitive behavioral school or any other school where expertise is your theoretical framework, dominance is how you impact your clients. So again, as clinicians, so I'm gonna, I said all that, I did all that, be really, really depressing, that's cool, it's fine. These are things that as a black man, I jostle with. And I wanted to give you that, that, that opportunity to feel it even for just a moment. <clears throat> but I want you to, now let's talk about how do we deal with it. And the reality is you gotta first sit with how you feel about things. Our profession does a piss poor job of, 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 we do a really, really bad job of telling you, you must be neutral, you must be objective. When in reality, there is no objectivity and neutrality doesn't exist. Because if objectivity were possible, then that would mean that we would have to turn off who we are as persons, right? So Teresa, who you are goes with you in the therapy room. But if, you know what I'm saying, if you had ice cream and you, you know, lactose intolerant and you get the roar in session, you can't turn that off. That's a subjective experience. And now you got to make peace with the fact that your client's over here weeping and your stomach is weeping at the same time. And that's just based on dietary choices, right? Right? That's just based on that. How much more then do you have to make peace with when you got up late and woke up on the wrong side of the bed and your client want to come in there with stuff that you don't care about? What about when your client has different political views than you do and they make it known in session, right? Or what about the idea that... <laughs> There is things such as geographic uh, uh, discrimination. And your client tells you that stuff like Flint, Michigan doesn't just happen in Flint, Michigan. They too are experiencing lead in their water or dilapidated housing. What do you do with it? Because we're not social workers, so we're not taught to acquire resources. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to jostle with the reality that goes into that, right? Like, so our profession, Houston and our, our profession, so give me two minutes and I'm gonna shut up and answer all the questions I can before we run out of time. A tenant of our profession is advocacy. And advocacy exists on multiple levels. I think the thing that our profession needs to do better is not teach us how to tell clients how to advocate, because we do that really well. We tell them the coping skills, you know, life is unfair, life sucks, get over it, right? That's basically the mentality that we give them, coping skills, make it through life, do the best you can going on. But I think our advocacy has to be bigger and louder because the people that we see are hurting in a way that our profession is not doing well. Because sometimes it's not the client's fault. And more times than not, a lot of the debilitating uh, mental health concerns that get really, really bad happen not through any fault of the client. We think about recidivism and the fact that people continue to go to jail, they continue to go to rehab, and they continue to make the same decisions as a failure on their part. When in reality, it's a failure on the part of their entire system. And it's a failure on our part. Not that we're responsible for them, but we are responsible to them. And sometimes being responsible to someone is to be angry for them. I know far too many people, men and women, boys and girls, and people who are gender non-conforming who've experienced sexual violence at the hands of other people. In my own personal life, and I've also had this said to me from clients, and what they've told me is, and nothing happened. That makes me angry. That pisses me off because you were a child. You were a, an adult, you were a person, and someone decided that your humanity was less important than their desire in that moment. We can understand that as clinicians, right? We understand that anger. But sometimes we struggle with the anger that people have when things such as getting unfairly harassed by the police happens. 
or, un or your intellect being questioned, right? I'm a, listen, I'm a smart man. I'm a, I'm a smart ass man. I work really, really hard to grow my intellect. And when people see the name Dr. Penny and they see me, they go, mm. they don't say it, but you can always look in their eyes and they go, mm. is it? How could he be? No, not him, right? Because intellect has a certain look to it, right? Like Cody knows me from bow ties and things of that nature. And that's because in the role of Dr. Penny, I'm gonna do that. But if you were to see me, because so you see me in vacation, right? Like this is uh, the, the, the running joke here. Champagne Winnie is, is out here on vacation. Champagne Winnie. So it looks different, but it doesn't mean I'm any less smart. When I go to the store in sweats and a t-shirt, it doesn't make me dumb. When I listen to the music that I enjoy with cursing and slang, it doesn't make me stupid, right? Like it, because if listening to things like Nirvana or the people like U2 or Gwen Stefani, if that doesn't make people who are white stupid, why then does listening to Young Thug make me stupid? Anyway, so I think, right? Because I'm pro, so I'm, I believe in feminist and womanist perspectives of, of being a clinician. I believe we should all get angry and burn this shit down to the ground because our, cli our clients suffer when we don't. When we are members of the status quo, when we are cogs in the system wheel that serves to crush them, our clients suffer. There's a lot that goes on and there's a lot of things that happen when we consider intersectionality, but each of you, so I'm gonna end it with this and then I'm gonna open up the question. Each of you can really impact the lives of other people once you understand how everything about you makes sense and then extend the same empathy and compassion that you would ask people to give it when you give it to your clients. And I don't just mean in the session, I also mean when you're considering their diagnosis, when you're reviewing their paperwork, when you're writing your notes, when you're consulting about the case. That is the part of it that makes the most, that makes the most difference. Because that is the part of it uh, <clears throat> that says all that that's the part of it that that goes into how you how you treat them yes joe so all right so i'm gonna do it again i'm gonna try my best to go through the the nine again because joey asked me so if someone will put it in the chat then we can have it there and then if you can't put it in the chat i'll put the name of the lady in the chat and the addressing model and then uh then we, you can find on your own because it's a really good model so i'll put it in the chat as you talk dr penny huh you put it in there uh, yeah Okay, perfect. So the A in the addressing model is for age and cohort effects, all right? The first D is for disability. The second D is for developmental disability, so they kind of go together, so it's DD, all right? The R is for, am I spelling this right? Yeah, I think I'm spelling this right. Uh, the R is for racial and ethnic identity, right? The E, the first, the only E is for uh, education. <clears throat> the first S is for uh, socioeconomic status. Um, what was the second S for? Oh, the second S was for uh, spirituality and religious ideology, right? Spiritual orientation. <clears throat> the I is for indigenous status and heritage. Um, the N is for a national origin, okay? And then the G is for gender. And I like to lump in sexual orientation there as well, because I feel like there's a sexual orientation that goes somewhere up there. Maybe I gave y'all an extra S. I don't know, we'll figure it out, it's fine. I missed the N. You missed the N, it's national origin. So your nationality, you're, you're, where you're from? Cool, 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 cool. So, we got four minutes or three minutes. Uh, I know Cody's trying to get us out of here a minute early. So talk to me, any questions? I saw someone said they wanted to learn more about the feminist perspective, but I didn't see who said it. Uh, I messaged her. Okay, perfect, 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 perfect. All right, talk to me. <laughs> Naomi, is that you? Are you hot, Naomi? Huh? Your mic, hi, like, I think your mic is on now. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that was an error, sorry. No, Oops. you're fine. If you have a question, you can ask it. Sure, sure, I, I didn't have a question. I was, okay. yeah. 
Anybody else? I'm trying to see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. No, I don't think so. Let's see here. No. I do have maybe a challenging question that I was sort of debating whether or not I wanted to ask it. Okay. I like to ask challenging questions. So as you were talking, Dr. Penny, um, you know, looking at it from a, um, a, a white female's perspective, um, you know, when we look at white females, we're, you know, you know, the, the general perspective is very affluent. They have a lot of resources and they're, they're, they have access to a lot of things that maybe not other individuals do. So as you were talking and, and speaking about um, the African-Americans point of view on a lot of things, do you think that there's ever going to be a time where a white person and a black person will be able to look at each other and be like, OK, we may look different, but that doesn't necessarily mean we have less access to um, certain resources or we have less access to, um, let's say, um, you know, or even as is going, you know, as far as, you know, I look at you and think like, oh, just because you're not in a suit means you're, you know, you have a different intelligence level than me. So I sort of was wondering if you, from your perspective on things, you think we're ever going to get to a point where it's like, I'll look at a black person on the street and, you know, may not know anything about them, but I won't pass judgment. Oh, <clears throat> so that's a good question. It's not as or difficult. Or vice versa. A black person looking at me and thinking, oh, she's, you know, she's probably got, you know, four cars in the garage and she's got a great job, although I'm $150,000 in student debt and can't really, I live paycheck to paycheck. So, welcome, welcome, right? right? So it's, that's why I was sort of just like, you know, the, the view of a black person to a white person sort of is the same from a white person to a black person because, you know, we, we have different skin colors, but we may be experiencing something completely different from what they might see on the outside and they just assume. And I guess it just goes back to just the assumption, right? So I, I, I think, so there's a, I think you asked me a question and then like answers your own question. <laughs> okay. But I, I'm going to answer your question based on what you said. I don't, I, do I think it is possible? Sure. Do I think it is probable? Not likely. And the reason why I say that is because in order for us to get to a place where, um, where people can see each other as people, right? We have to undo the advantages that you have. Right. And even though you as a Jordan man don't have like, I don't, you don't, you got 150 racks in, in debt. Right. Right. But the reality is that your $150,000 versus my $170,000. Right. You, Jordan, will get more opportunities to make money than I will. So it's not about where we start from. It's about the doors that are open to us based on the presentation that exists. Right. So, Jordan, you as a person who presents as a white woman, who presents as a cisgender white woman, who presents as a cisgender, and I'm, and I'm making assumptions based on the fact that, you know, what the presentation is here. Um, that means that the doors will be open to you. So you have long hair. So the assumption is, oh, she must be heterosexual because that's what heteronormativity says. Long, if your hair is short and you're a woman, you probably like women. It's that kind of thing, right? So right. if we look at it from the fact that perceptions are shaped, and they're shaped early and they're shaped often and they're shaped consistently, right? Because life will give us the same things. It's not enough for me and Cody to be cool, right? Because I love Cody. Cody's a great man. I love him. And Cody presents as a white, cisgender, heterosexual man who got kids and got a degree, right? But here's something that is also interesting. That Cody being a white man and him being a good white man to me does not negate the fact that Cody is a singular person. Right. Whereas when it comes to being a black person, me as a singular person can frame how you all experience black people for the rest of your life. That's the difference is that as a white person, you have strategic and systemic advantages that I don't have. No matter what I do, no matter how smart I am, if I were to go right now, because me and my partner are looking for a house, right? Let me go, I'm gonna move back to Houston, right? Um, we're looking for a house and looking at house prices. I can easily pay for whatever X number amount a month is, right? 
But it mm-hmm. doesn't mean that when I go in to get the loan, that I'm going to be treated the same way. Right. So Jordan, you as an individual, right, may be a great person. You may be the salt of the earth. But you being the salt of the earth is not enough for me to see you as a person who's struggling like I'm struggling. Right, right. Your face isn't dirty. You you don't have no uh, dirt under your fingernails because you don't look like a poor white person. And so is it possible? Yes, because anything is possible. But is it probable? Nah, because it would require a lot of sacrifices. Right, right who have a lot of power and you will, we know his power is not yielded nicely yeah you got to take power yeah so it's a lot that's why we only have one king and one queen so i get it i mean mm. <laughs> so yeah well thanks so much for answering that you know way loaded question it was a it's a good question and i think it has i think it has a very wonderful heart tied to it I think it's just, it's a difficult question because it is not a simple answer. Yeah. Answer with a lot of layers. It requires a lot of other stuff to go into. But it's 1103. I've kept you far too long. Um, fat meat is greasy. I'm sorry. Um, if you hear me say, every in a presentation with me, you hear me say random things. It's to bring my, my brain back so I can finish what I'm talking about. So. All right. Sounds good. Well, go enjoy your vacation. I know you've been waiting around. Oh, for this is the work day. This is the work day. Do you hear me? I got work to do as soon as I leave. Grading, grading, grading. Thanks, grading. Dr. All Penny. No all right, problem. Right. You all have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your call. Thanks, Dr. Penny. Bye. All right, Doc. See you later, buddy. Bye. Bye. Can I send my email if anybody would want to connect with me, Cody? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Mm-hmm.